Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in commencing, I want to pay my respects to the uh, Wadawurrung people, the traditional owners, I don't need that, do I, of the land uh, on, on which we're meeting uh, right now, and uh, to pay respects to their elders past and present, and I want to thank them for the care of the land and country. Uh, as you know, we are here for the uh, 2018 Harrison Innovation Lecture and Barry Jones Medal presentation. The Harrison Innovation Lecture is named in honor of James Harrison, the first editor of the Geelong Advertiser and one of Australia's original innovators. Is that echoing a lot? I could do this. I don't really, I don't even think I need that. Uh, the, in, in any case, uh, James Harrison invented the mechanical refrigeration process for creating ice and, uh, and, and several other achievements as well. Uh, for this lecture, it is really more in the form of a TED Talk type event, uh, and we have a real treat in store uh, this afternoon. The Barry Jones Medal honors an individual deemed to have made a significant sustained contribution to research and innovation excellence in the region and, uh, and to have promoted Geelong as a place of research and innovation. <clears throat> the medal itself is named after uh, the Honorable Barry Jones, uh, who, who is named as, uh, as Australia's living treasure. Uh, he, he, uh, he's one of the great champions for research and innovation in Australia. Barry has served as Australia's Minister for Science. He's an acclaimed public uh, intellectual, a social and political activist, a writer, and an academic. In addition, Barry was born in Geelong. Uh, he, he, we're privileged uh, to, uh, to have had him agree to have his name uh, associated with, with the medal. Unfortunately, Barry uh, cannot be here with us today. Uh, he's been called to Sydney for a funeral uh, and service of a close friend. Uh, uh, I'll say a bit more about that in, in a few minutes, but uh, a, a, brief, uh, a brief few words on uh, when and how research and innovation has become embedded in the fabric of, of Geelong. In, in 1994, the Geelong Chamber of Commerce established an education and research committee. The committee was comprised of chamber members involved in those two fields. The aim was to promote research and education uh, 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 to the Geelong community so that the local community became aware of its local strengths in the fields of education and research. From the education and research committee of the chamber, an education and research network was formed of local providers. Deakin University was, was one of those, uh, the Gordon was one of those, and there were several other uh, founding members of that network as well. The network was awarded a grant of, uh, by Oz Industry to conduct a feasibility study with a commitment of further Commonwealth funding uh, as well. Uh, however, internal government funding cuts uh, precluded the further funding that was expected. Uh, no one gave up on it, nevertheless, and in the late 1990s, the network changed its name to the Smart Geelong Network, and it set itself up as a not-for-profit uh, not company limited by guarantee. Smart Geelong was an explicit reference to innovation within our community. The Smart Geelong Network continued to promote research and education in Geelong, and uh, it was successful in getting a grant from the Victorian Department of State and regional development in 2002. And from that, a suite of brochures was produced and, uh, and a, uh, uh, a, a, a set of promotional activities helped Geelong, uh, Smart Geelong Network raise awareness outside of the community. So it started as a focus uh, uh, on the internals and building, building knowledge and then shifted its focus to the outside. Uh, in 2005, the Smart Geelong Network organized its first research and learning expo with a grant of $25,000 from, uh, from the Treasurer and Minister for Science and Innovation, John Brumby. That uh, event morphed into Research Week and a, a research awards competition. For the next 10 years, Research Week and Researcher of the Year awards were highlights of the Geelong education and research calendar. 
Researchers enjoyed the recognition and the opportunity to network with each other and uh, with community and business and industry leaders. Guest speakers brought a range of fresh ideas into the region. In, the tw in, the 20 in 2014, the tenth and final research week and award ceremony achieved the largest attendance and the largest number of entries, and, uh, and uh, it also marked uh, the first award of a Barry Jones medal. Here today, we will make the fifth award of that, of that medal. Fa fa almost to the end of the story here. Following the uh, 10th Research Week, the Geelong Chamber of Commerce and Deakin University combined effort uh, to widen the focus with an emphasis on research and innovation beyond the fields of education and research alone. Moving forward, the Harrison Lecture and Barry Jones Medal Ceremony have served as a celebration of research and innovation in business and community, as, as well as education and research uh, organizations. So thank you all for attending this year's event. I'm sure we're going to have a stimulating and entertaining experience this afternoon. The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the medal awardee uh, uh, a, a is also uh, uh, someone who has contributed si significantly and substantially to research and innovation, and uh, both within Geelong and within the global community as well. And I, I, I think that'll become clear when we, when we uh, provide some information about it. With respect to the lecture, this year we have invited Professor Khan Mazakis to deliver the Harrison Innovation Lecture. Professor Khan Mazakis is the co-director of Deakin's new Applied Artificial Intelligence Institute. <clears throat> Uh, also known as A Square I Square, and the uh, director of the ARC Industrial Transformation Research Hub for Digital Enhanced Living. He's a decision support and software development expert with over 30 years of experience. Prior to his appointment as director of the Deakin Software Technology Innovation Lab in 2016, Professor Mazakis was the director of the Swinburne Software Innovation Lab uh, for over 20 years. Khan has developed software solutions and concept de demonstrators for a wide range of organizations. In collaboration with the Alfred Hospital's Trauma Center, he developed the Trauma Reception and Resuscitation Decision Support Tool, a world-first development that reduced the number of errors made by clinicians. Uh, clinicians in the room, of course, realized that no mistakes are, really are made, but. Uh, We'll, get, we'll, we'll grant him. We'll grant him that. Uh, and uh, uh, but it refers to the to the errors made in the first 30 minutes of a patient arriving at the Alfred's Trauma Center. So, it, having said all that, I'd like to introduce Professor Pazakis uh, to give us the Harrison Lecture. So, uh, thank you very much for those kind words, Joe. And uh, and I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, a journey that's been going on for the last uh, 20 odd years and some of the work that I've done in, in a number of different areas and uh, of course I, I, uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of my colleagues that are here today and thank you for, for, for being here. So the, the university in its wisdom has, uh, has allowed us to form this new institute and of course I have my other, my co-director Professor Sveta Venkatesh here with me. And, uh, and the executive director, Simon, Dr. Simon Parker, which is which is great. So we're we're going to go on the journey as of uh, as of now um, in in this space of artificial intelligence. And I can tell you one thing right now, right here, and I'll explain it a bit later on. No one's losing their job. <laughs> so I want to also um, let you uh, understand that there's a bit of a misconception, and I'll just turn this thing around so I can see where I'm up to next. They wanted me to give a TED talk, so no notes, no anything. So that's, that's the way it is. So the idea is that we wanted to, to explain to you the difference between machine learning and AI. So machine learning, we, we use these, these fancy computers. Now, 30 years ago we had computers, but they couldn't do what they do today because we didn't have what's known as a graphical processor unit. And that came about because some companies like Sony created these things called PlayStations, and I'm sure all of you at some point have uh, experienced this notion of a PlayStation because either your children or your grandchildren are, are using them right now. So they, they, they developed this thing called the Graphical Processing Unit, which allowed us to do more complex things because the central processing unit in computers was really dumb. 
it just couldn't cope with mathematics. So the GPU has, has been created and of course now it allows us to do things like machine learning. So we can ask the machine to learn things. The machine can only learn what we give it to learn. It's, it has no intelligence, it's very stupid, and it only understands zeros and ones. And mark my words, no machine is going to make decisions for us. Um, not in my lifetime, not in my son's lifetime, his children's lifetime, and it goes on and on and on. There's no way. Everyone, you know, from Google to that, that individual called Elon Musk, will say, you know, the robots are going to get us. They're not coming. So we, we <laughs> ask the machine, we ask the machine to learn, and, and it's a process of training, and the application is AI. So they're the two differences. So when people use them, you know, in, intermittently, you, you've got to pull them up and say, oh, sorry, it's not, it's machine learning, and the application is the artificial intelligence. So we created this notion of uh, a particular framework, and we call it the Toffee Framework, and you'll see why it's called the Toffee Framework, because we use, um, we use uh, the acronym um, very, very, very um, wisely. The first thing we need to do is target. We need to extract information and insights and provide relevant data um, to a particular individual. So if we don't extract that information and we can't make any sense of it, then we're not targeting that information to the right group of people. The next thing we need to do is we need to optimise. We need to optimise because we need to um, discover better ways of pushing this information and utilising the existing infrastructure that we have so that we can use all this information that we, we collect. Everyone collects information about just about anything. Anything and everything. Personally, I don't have a Facebook account. You won't see me on Facebook. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't have an Instagram account. I just don't want people knowing what I'm doing. You can follow me everywhere. So that's me. So this optimization bit, if, you, if we're collecting data, then we'll be able to optimize it and we'll be able to give the appropriate insights at the appropriate time and using the existing infrastructure. Now, you all know that our friends at the Bureau of Meteorology use about 15 different models to try and predict whether the, um, the, it's going to rain today or tomorrow. Um, and they, they sometimes get it right, and sometimes they get it wrong. And I keep on saying, so just look out the window, I can tell you what, exactly what's going on. It's either raining or it's not raining. But they use all these models, and if model 1 to 5 says it's not going to rain, and model 7 says it is, and then model 9 to 10 says it's not going to rain, well, they say probably it's not going to rain. And they normally get it right, but I'm not sure about some other things that they do. So we use forecasting and use historical data to develop accurate models. We use these models for potential future situations. That's what the modelling does. We model on this may happen. And of course, we like to improve. We need to examine the way people behave to improve their product, process, services, and so on and so forth, and the experience that they give in terms of, uh, in, in terms of what they're doing. So improvement is very very important. So that's why we've created this Toffee model or framework. If we use this framework across this, this notion of artificial intelligence, remember it's the application of the machine learning, then we might start to get to places. What I'm going to talk about is some of the applications that we've been developing in, in this space. And one of them is looking at behavioural anomalies. Now we have some people here um, from our, our good friends at the city of Geelong and we ran some trials here in the city of Geelong when we were building this, this system. The little box on, the, on your right hand side um, is, is called Sophie, um, Sophie Hub. And it uh, collects all the information from sensors, passive sensors within a home. And it uh, looks at anomalies. Now why did, we, why did we develop this? Well, it came about because uh, a few years earlier my colleague and I went to a conference in, in uh, San Francisco and, and Samsung was, was promoting all this new Butte sensor activity and uh, I thought this is great but you need to be a computer scientist to use it. How are we going to get it to you know, people that, that really need it? And at the time, my father had just passed away, mum was on her own at home and I was getting a little bit worried about, you know, we should be okay. So we started thinking about how do we put all this together? So on the flight between Los, Los Angeles and Melbourne, I woke him up and said, get up, stop sleeping. I can't sleep, so why should you? And, um, and uh, we're going to talk about this. And we sketched out this, this, this whole program of trying to look at how do we pull together behavioural anomalies. So we have sensors, we collect data, we trigger events. If they don't get out of bed at the normal, at the normal time, then we ask them, uh, you know, that a message would come up on the, on, on the speaker. You know, Connor, are you okay? 
Um, we, we noticed that you haven't got out of bed. Um, if you're okay, how about you walk into the kitchen? The minute they walk into the kitchen, we've known, we know that they've triggered a number of sensors, therefore they're moving. Um, one of the other things we did with this system was to look at uh, making sure that they took their medication. Now, of course, our elderly parents sometimes have this tendency, of course I took my medication, what's wrong with you? You know, um, and of course we know they haven't. And so we now put sensors on the cupboard to make sure that they open the cupboard, take the medication, well you can't see if they're taking the medication physically, but at least they've opened the cupboard and supposedly they're taking the medication. So we can, we can advise them to say, we've noticed that you haven't taken your medication because the cupboard door hasn't been opened and it's time for you to take your medication. And one of the other big things that we, um, we wanted to do was promote hydration. I have a real problem with my mother. She says to me, I'm not, I don't feel thirsty, therefore I don't need to drink any water. Well, hang on a minute. And then the next day she says to me, I've got a headache. I'm thinking, no water, headache the next day. I know why, she didn't drink any water. So I'm always constantly on to her about, have you had any water to drink? Yeah, I've had enough of this water, I've got to keep on going to the toilet. Yeah, don't care. Right? I want you to be hydrated. Now, we can, we can pick up whether they're being hydrated or not. If the temperature rises and they're not, they're not moving into the kitchen, we can put a sensor on the tap, we can see whether or not they're having any water. And we can remind them, it's a hot day, time to have some water. And we can also turn their air conditioning on. You know what you like, I'm not feeling hot today, and it's 33 degrees in the house. And they're wearing a jumper. So we can turn that on. So this is, this is part of what we're doing, is creating a system that allows us to look at these anomalies, and we're only looking at anomalies, to make sure that we can inform them that this is what's going on. Now, if they happen to fall, we're working on a system that will be able to pick it up, and it's not a camera, and it's not a camera. So one of the things we do right now is that we ask them how long do they spend in, their bar in the bathroom, and they might say 20 minutes. So we program the device to say, you know, Con's in the bathroom, normally between this time and this time, and we have a sensor, just a motion sensor. We know they've walked into the bathroom, and they're, doing, they're having a shower or whatever, and if they, if they don't leave the bathroom within 20 minutes, the, the solution will come up and say, we've noticed that you're, you're, you're still in the bathroom, are you okay? If you are, just move into the bedroom. If they don't, then we've got an escalation process and we'll send the appropriate uh, um, messages to the appropriate people and make sure that that individual is okay. So these are the, these are the sort of things that we're using as a, as a mechanism for picking up anomalies. We're using the machine, the machine's learning that thing there, that device there inside has a small computer and it collects all the data, so it's learning. So from that learning, we've, we're using the application AI and we can do these sort of things. One of the other things that we're doing is that I am absolutely um, terrified of getting blown up in an airport. Not inside the airport, but outside, you know, because you hear it all the way through Europe, you know, this bomber just, you know, had the bomb and off it went and so on and so forth. So one of the things we've done is that we can use the security cameras at, a, at an airport to look for anomalies. And how do we look for those anomalies? Well, we just take five seconds of someone's, uh, someone's face and we process that and see what their heart rate is. No, no, no touching of the human. All we need to do is uh, take five seconds of video and we process that video and we can show whether their heart rate is elevated or not elevated. Now our friends in Psychology and psychiatry tell us that physically you might look very calm, but internally your heart rate will be racing and we can pick that up. So this is now being thought about for not only if they're going to blow themselves up, but more to the point, are they bringing drugs into the country? Is this, a, is this an opportunity for us to think about you know, picking up those individuals? Um, this is an interesting one. We're using facial recognition um, profiling to see if the right person is going to sit the exam when they say they, they, they're the ones sitting the exam. Now, we did, a, a did, we did something very, very sneaky. Um, we looked at all of the people that were sitting a, uh, an, an exam in India, in a particular region, um, for the police force. Now, typically, 10,000 people apply. From those 10,000 people, they have to do four separate different exams, physical, written, etc., etc., and then they actually um, are, are taken on and, and they only take maybe a thousand odd people um, in the police force for that particular district. 
what had happened was that they needed to work out if there was transparency in what was happening. In other words, was the person who was saying that they did the oral exam, the same person that did the written exam, the same person that did the physical exam, and the same per person that went to the final interview? And guess what? Out of the 10,000 people that, did, that, that, that sat that uh, process, we found 79 that were not the right people. You'll, you'll turn around and say, but it was only 79. Well, 79 out of 1,000 we're going to take. At the, end of the, at the end of that process is still a significant number. So, machine learns, learns the patterns, learns the face, et cetera, et cetera. You know, every time they come up, is this the right person doing the right thing? Now, I'd like to talk about this uh, a little bit longer. So this is a project that we started in um, 2000 and 2008 with the trauma center at the Alfred Hospital. So the Alfred Hospital is the largest trauma centre in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. It takes 90% of the adult trauma in the state of Victoria, 10% goes to the Royal Melbourne, and all the kids go to the children's. So at the Alfred, um, the, the doctors knew that they had to make decisions. They didn't know how long each decision, every when did they have to make that decision. Their process in terms of inserting tubes down someone's throat or putting a tube into the side so they can get rid of the the, the, the blood and so on and so forth, they could do that with their eyes shut. The problem was that they knew they were making mistakes, as in not doing the right thing. So we, we, we spoke to them, we built a system, we, we, we took us nine months to build this uh, trauma reception resuscitation application, and then we trialled it over 33 months. Two trauma bays with the technology, two trauma bays without the technology, and then did a comparison to see what was better. Well, in fact, what happened was, we reduce the errors of omission, that is, the, er the errors where they forget to do something by, by 21%. And as a consequence of that, we also didn't know, but as a, as a consequence of doing this trial for 33 months, we reduced the amount of blood that was being administered by 30%, which was quite significant. So 21% um, reduction in errors. They had to make a decision every 72 seconds. As the clock ticked, it was a decision every 72 seconds, which was pretty important. Um, they then said, this is fantastic. This is actually translating to five or six lives being saved every year by just looking at making sure we reduce the errors of emission. Now, our clinicians in, at, at the trauma will say, at the trauma center will say, we don't make mistakes, but they knew that they made mistakes. They're very good at doing the process. They knew they were making mistakes and they wanted to fix that. And of course, they're well, well regarded in this space. So we now, of course, have uh, sent this technology to the largest trauma uh, facility in India, in New Delhi. And it obviously helped reduce the errors of emission there um, significantly, more than 21%. I won't tell you what the figure was. We now have it translated in Chinese and it's being used in, in southern China in a number of different uh, hospitals in, in, in southern China. And we are, we are implementing it in the kids King Saud Medical City in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. So it's, it's being used. The Americans want it. They can't use it because they have to get uh, permission from the person who's wrapped themselves around a tree um, because they had an accident. They need to get them to sign. Whereas here in Australia, we don't need to do any of that. We'll extract it, we'll give them the care, and we'll deal with the rest later. So this is quite significant, and, and we're now looking at how do, we, how do we collect all the data that, and all the decisions that they're making, and how do we use machine learning to provide us with better outcomes? Because there might be things that they don't need to do that they're doing right now. One of the other things that we're working on with our friends at the Royal Melbourne and at the Alfred is, um, is in the area of epilepsy, epileptic fits. Um, epileptic fits uh, are, are very common for those who suffer from epilepsy and the holy grail is can we predict a minute before it happens to give that person the opportunity to sit down, pull over, do whatever they need to do to make themselves safe before it happens. So we're working with um, Professor Terry O'Brien who's moved from the Royal Melbourne to the Alfred and, and both teams from both the Royal Melbourne and the Alfred now to, um, to look at this, to look at this um, uh, problem. 
This is, this is a, a waveforms from, they wear, they have a sleep clinic where people who suffer from epilepsy go and spend the whole week in the hospital and they have them monitored for the whole time they're there. And these are recordings of what happens on a 32, um, on a cap that they wear, which has got 32 sensors. And we're trying to work out that oximetry, blood pressure, heart rate, what is it that we can, we can measure and we can then trigger by getting by building something that they can wear, which will give them that uh, that that information. This is this is at least five years away, but we're getting closer. We're now using we're now using the machine to learn the patterns and highlight the areas where we need to look at more closely. So, artificial intelligence um, and it's and has its massive potential. It certainly does. It has a lot of potential, but we need to be clear. We need to be, be clear about one thing. We are trying to give more information, more appropriate information, for the human to make the decision. We are not in any way, we are not in any way going to remove the human from that decision making process. So we have coined it human in the loop AI. Human in the loop AI. The human will always make that decision. And it's very important to make sure that the human makes that decision. And of course, as I say, um, it's got potential, it has some limitations, and of course, it has some risks. And, and you've heard about these risks. You know, our friends at Tesla had the car driving down the street and the semi-trailer decided to do a U-turn. Guess what? It went straight through the semi-trailer. Why? Because it didn't know that, you know, this white canvas that was on the, front, on the side of the semi-trailer um, was not, you know, the, the, the rest of the sky or the road that it was travelling on. One of the things that we have issues with is that when we start programming these autonomous vehicles, what, 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 what do we stop? Do we stop the car from hitting the pram that's crossing the road when they didn't make it across the road? Or do we let, or do we let the car hit the other car that's on the side of the road so we don't hit the pram with the baby in it? Which one? There's some really interesting questions and some very serious questions about how we might deal with it. So that's why the human needs to make that decision. We can't rely on the um, on, on, on the vehicle. So, um, how do we implement uh, AI in organisations? There's a, there's a variety of way, ways, but we need to have people embedded into these organisations, embedded into these organisations, so they can know that the human is going to make the final decision. This is a uh, this is a picture of a uh, of a uh, uh, of a Tesla uh, with its fancy uh, fancy screen and and autonomous driving and so on. And of course we see a number of different problems that have been um, shown up because of the way in which it's been developed. I can tell you as a software engineer, I wouldn't buy one. <laughs> I wouldn't buy one because I've seen the code that actually drives the intelligence, supposedly, of this vehicle. And if any of my students or any of my, any, any of my software engineers wrote code like this, I'd kill them. <laughs> because it's going to kill you. It's not very good. It is really, really dangerous. So, again, I talk about human in the loop AI. I talk about making sure that the human is making that decision and we are building systems to enhance the individual who will make those decisions. Not let a computer make a decision on, on whether someone is going to be saved in the trauma centre because the computer is going to make those, uh, those decisions. No, the human will make those decisions. It's a big area. It's a big area to look at. There's a lot of ethical issues that we need to deal with. There's a lot of um, social issues that we, and, and societal issues that we need to make decisions about. And one of the things that the Institute will be looking at is what are, what are these issues and how are we going to, how are we going to cover these off as, as, a, as, a, as an institute um, for applied artificial intelligence? Very, very important. It's not just the technology that we're looking at, we're also going to be looking at those, those ethical issues that are associated with that. As part of the Transformation Hub for Digital Enhanced Living, we're trying to move um, you know, the, the activities that, that potentially would happen in nursing facilities now being transferred to someone's home. And we know the elderly here in, um, in, in Melbourne, certainly, uh, sorry, here in Geelong, and certainly in Melbourne, they all want to stay in their own home. They don't want to move out of their home. They want to be in their home 
They want to be, and so we're trying to move that digital frontier to help them stay in their homes. So that's part of my other role as the director of the Australian Research Council on um, Digital Enhanced Living. And we're building systems um, with our other friends and, other, and our, our other uh, colleagues at the university and the other universities that are involved in this program to do that. So thank you very much for sitting here and listening to my talk on, on, on the Applied Artificial Intelligence Institute and some of the examples that we've, we've been dealing with over the last few years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bazakas. So this brings us to the end of the innovation lecture component of the event and straight into uh, the award of the 2018 Barry Jones Medal. Our, uh, our awardee this, uh, this year is Professor Saeed Nahavandi. Saeed is Director of the Institute for Intelligent Systems Research and Innovation and Pro Vice Chancellor Defense Technologies at Deakin University. His work and that of the Institute involves advanced ro robotics, haptics, and logistics research augmented by artificial intelligence and virtual reality technologies. Applications of, of the research cover a wide range of real world contexts. So, some of the work includes multi purpose robots for Victoria Police, an ultrasound instrument that can be operated from a distance of well over 2,000 kilometers away. Uh, Flame, which is an AI and uh, virtual reality enhanced haptic firefighting tra firefighter training system, a universal motion simulator that is used to train operators in a wide range of simulated vehicle contexts and also test operator tolerances. Uh, the, and, and, and in addition, a range of very complex haptically driven devices for use in training surgeons. This is sort of a reflection back to the, to the previous uh, discussion. And finally, defense equipment, ve vehicular and logistics applications in, in defense. Bar Dr. Barry Jones uh, cannot be here with us today uh, to make the award, and he asked me to do so on, on his behalf. He also sent these words. I, I had been looking forward to being with you all in Geelong for the award of the medal. However, having been especially uh, uh, invited, Ra Rachel and I felt that we should attend the memorial service and concert in Sydney for our great friend Richard Gill, the eminent conductor and outstanding educator. Clearly, the Barry Jones Medal for 2018 has been awarded to an outstanding achiever. Professor Nahavandi directs Deakin University's Institute for Intelligent Systems Research and Innovation and is an expert, among other things, on haptics, a word which would be unfamiliar to most Australians, not to mention our leaders. There's a Barry Jones whack for you, you know. He, 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 <laughs> the ultrasound machine may be able to operate from 2,000 kilometers away, but Australia's living treasure can do it as well. So anyway, uh, haptic feedback devices create the illusion of substance and force within the virtual world. They will be of increasing importance in coming years. For example, a universal motion simulator is used to train operators uh, in a wide range of, of vehicle contexts and his references to the, the, to the use of hap haptics and, and, and VR in, in that. And uh, uh, my, my warmest congratulations to Saeed and his institute and to Deakin University generally for its active support of innovation originating in Geelong but of global significance. Ladies and gentlemen, I call on uh, Professor Saeed Nahavandi to step up and receive his award. Once again, our, uh, oh, you would like to say some words, I'm sure. <laughs> never, sh never short, never short of a word or two. 
good, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, many thanks. Uh, wow, what a great honor. This will sit at the apex of my most valuable possessions in my thinking garage at home. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the unreserved help and support of my wife, who unfortunately, due to work commitment, uh, could not be here. A sincere thanks to all of my PhD students. Uh, their hard work and great quality of research often facilitated quality publications and also external funding. Also, I am blessed to be surrounded by very intelligent, capable and very energetic research staff who never take no for an answer. I would like to acknowledge Deakin University for providing such an innovation fertile ground for all of its research researches under the great leadership of our Deputy Vice Chancellor Research. And I personally have taken advantage of the opportunity with 20% inspiration and 90% perspiration. So I guess that makes 110%. I better go to maths class and learn that 90 and 20 makes 110. It's not 100. But then again, when we promise to deliver a project, we put 110%, not 100%. It has been a, quite a journey, but really an enjoyable one. Uh, my creative journeys always start inside an aircraft. Long distance journey, economy class. It is better not to get too comfortable. Time of self-reflection and deep thinking without any distraction. That is when I challenge myself to come up with the next weird idea. And testing myself if I get value for money from my brain. And obviously, many times, I come up with a rather negative answer, which makes me disappointed. And that is when I turn to my research team, and they turn it around with great enthusiasm into the next best thing. I guess they feel sorry for me, but it often works. Also, finally, last but not least, a special thanks to my PA, uh, Trisha O'Toole, who has endured working with me for the past 20 years at Deakin. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just earlier this afternoon, uh, Saeed received his 20-year uh, service pin from uh, Deakin University, and the university is really glad to have uh, him and what is a world full of weird ideas, which, which, which fortunately get translated into very innovative and uh, in some cases world-changing uh, developments. So that, uh, uh, that brings us to the end. I want to once again thank uh, the Honorable Barry Jones for gracing the medal with his name and uh, congratulations once more to Saeed. And I want to thank you on behalf of the entire Geelong Regional Community for, uh, for your inspirational uh, contribution to promoting and advancing local research and innovation. Having said all that, uh, it's time to conclude the event. We have refreshments. Please hang around, uh, ha have something to drink, and, uh, and uh, network with each other. If you don't have friends yet, uh, there's plenty to be made. And we'll see you next year for the next innovative le innovation lecture. Thank you. Thank you.